Okay, welcome to the second session of the Humanities Podcast Network Symposium. This year, we're focusing on how local contexts matter for humanities podcasting. And my name is Kim Adams. Um, I am one of the three organizers for this year's conference, and uh, we're going to do a short introduction and apologies if you were in the first session already and you heard this, but just in case we have new folks. Um, so we have four sessions approaching the local from different directions. The first, which took place at 11 a.m. today, was podcasting at Scholarship, producing knowledge in your area, and there will be a YouTube recording of it available soon if you missed it. Um, this session, which you guys are joining us for, is podcasting pedagogies, soundscapes in the classroom. And the next session at 3 p.m. is the craft of podcasts, making, distributing, and listening. And our final session at 5 p.m. today, Eastern Time, is podcasts in the world, communities, industries, and social justice. And um, I need to find the right, okay. Uh, so I'm Ilan, I'm another of the organizers of this symposium. Um, I'm based in Brooklyn, New York. And um, so just to let you know, each session meets for an hour in this Zoom room. It's the same link all day. The session leaders will begin the conversation on the topic and then they'll open it up to all the attendees for the second half of the session. So we encourage you to ask questions and share your insights and experiences. Uh, we also ask that you keep yourself on mute until you're called upon and to be respectful to all the conference participants. And my name is Rebecca Berry. I'm based in New Haven, Connecticut. And if you haven't worked with us before, the Humanities Podcast Network is a collective of instructors, scholars, and independent creators dedicated to the transformative impact of audio media and the human voice. We work horizontally to empower people and make and use podcasts for education and scholarship. You can check out our website and learn more at humanitiespodnetwork.org. So just to be clear, the Zoom room will remain open between sessions if you want to stay after the hour and chat. And for the first time ever, there is an in-person component of our symposium. We're going to be dropping a list of all of the meetups that are happening across North America and one location in the UK in the chat. And today's sessions will be recorded and posted to our YouTube channel after the conference. If you don't want to appear in the recording, that's fine. Just make sure you keep your audio and video off. Thank you so much for attending and we look forward to hearing your voice. Now I'd like to pass it off to our session leaders to begin. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you. Um, so um, actually, I'm, I'm going to start uh, the session and then I'm going to give the floor uh, to Adam right after me. And uh, just a quick introduction. My name is Ahmed Yusuf. I'm an assistant professor of digital media and instructional technology at East Strasbourg University. It is in the eastern side of Pennsylvania. So we're very close to New Jersey and New York. Um, so like I have been uh, actually focusing on a uh, podcast uh, from a pedagogical perspective, because this is like an integral part of some courses that I'm teaching. Uh, one of them is education, communication, and technology. And um, what I want actually to uh, to pr present today or talk about is the decision of using podcast um, in class. Like when should we use a podcast and also what type of podcast? Like because we have like different types. You can have like a podcast for three, four or five minutes. It is like a kind of podcast that I am uh, hosting uh, actually, uh, which is called Education Espresso. Or it could be something like up to 60 minutes and some, sometimes like more than uh, than one hour. So uh, what I want to do like briefly is to share with you uh, this um uh, flow chart it is that I created based on my experience like teaching podcast and also using it for uh, like assessment purposes and also I'm going to share it with you in the chat uh, right after uh, I'm done so if like feel free to uh, download it and use it so like when you start like any class teaching any content so you start with the learning objectives and the learning objectives inform uh, two things like your assessment and your instruction like the way that you are going to deliver uh, the content in the class so when it comes to uh, the assessment um, you need to decide on the complexity like the level of complexity of the assessment and the learning objective so for example example, if it's like, um, 
if it's a basic uh, level. So uh, this means that you need to make like your podcast, like if you're going to ask students to produce a podcast, so you need to make it like really short and you don't have to include any interviews or anything. It could be like a solo podcast. And if you are going to, it's a medium level of difficulty when it comes to the assessment or the learning objectives, but actually you are uh, relying more on comprehension and application. In other words, like students are going to apply something, compare something. So that could be like a medium uh, a medium level. Uh, uh, and in this case, you can use like a 10 to 20 minutes podcast if you want to ask students to produce something like that. And that could be like a solo or an interview. Of course, if you are focusing on other three levels of analysis, evaluation and synthesis, which is like a bit complex, so in this case, um, you are promoting critical thinking. And in order to uh, ask students, like, you know, like to produce something, like a podcast uh, that incorporates a critical thinking. So in this case, it would be great if you give them like the option to like for an interview and also like for a long uh, podcast, which is like an hour or maybe like more than an hour. Other uh, faculty members or instructors, teachers, sometimes they would say, no, I don't want actually students to produce a podcast. I'm going to use it myself in order to uh, introduce the materials or to explain it to students. So in this case here, we will go back to the left side of the flow chart, and that is the instruction. So in this case, you need to ask yourself, is my instruction approach, is it deductive or inductive? In other words, if it's deductive, so you start with explaining the concept, the theory, something like that, and then you provide examples. In this case, it is recommended that you use a podcast, like a solo podcast, no interviews, just to explain the concept and uh, uh, and then the examples. But if you want, if you are relying on inductive uh, kind of instructional uh, uh, delivery, uh, so in this case, uh, you, like you start with examples or something. So like, so here, like the like you have different options. So it's either like to use a relatively um, like. A relatively medium uh, length of of podcast, which is like ten to twenty minutes, uh, or you can use like a long one because you want to elaborate on the examples, and then you want students actually to uh, get into the concept or to explain the concept uh, through the example. Um, so this sort of uh, this sort of um, uh, flow chart that may like be like a guide to uh, to help you decide on the length of the podcast, the type of the podcast, and how it how it should be linked to the learning objectives, uh, and to be more specific to the assessment or to the instruction uh, part. Um, it could be like it may work for some, it may not work for others, but again, it is something that it, it could be like you can use it as a general uh, guideline. Um, so I will now like give the floor to Adam. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Ahmed, um, I'm Adam Fowler. I teach podcasting and sound design at the University of Salford in Greater Manchester, UK. I came in from industry. I'm a radio producer by trade. And uh, so what I'm teaching is podcasting. And I'm in the, I have to say that in the process of that, I thought, wait a minute, surrounded by fellow academics for the first time working in academia, uh, thinking perhaps that what I do with these students might be of use to my colleagues who are not in the media or or teaching people media related subjects. So to that end, I took I just a, a very quick explanation of what I do with my podcasters. Um, we, my advanced podcasters anyway, we review a whole series, a whole podcast, which is Let's Make a Sci-Fi, which is CBC and is very funny, but also has lots of really good teaching about how to structure stories and pitch ideas. So it's useful for, for us on that level as well. They practice for six weeks, bringing in other listening that they've done to compare. So I would say it's a complex podcast to use Ahmed's template. And I want it to sound like a podcast and they get graded partly on how good a professional sounding podcast is. However, I have, and for the purposes of this symposium meeting, I want to talk about how I've taken that to other colleagues' classes. Now, I have... Um, a professor of politics who I've run the class in. And I'm just going to share my screen very briefly and you will see what Martin Bull, Professor Martin Bull had to say about it. I can get my buttons right. Oh. 
nope, it's not going to do it. It's I'm going to cancel that. I'm going to share it without audio because it's not wanting me to share it with audio. So that's okay. However, you can see what he says. I'm hoping you can see that. Uh, shout if you can't. Um, he was hugely enthusiastic about how engaged his students were. Now, these were students who normally would have been doing a couple of thousand word essay uh, as a solo project, as a solo assessment. They were now working in groups. I taught them a little bit about how to use the Roadcaster Pro, if anyone's familiar with the Roadcaster Pro. Um, it's a wonderful bit of kit. It's a, a mobile podcasting studio, if you like, and four students can sit around and record and they can play in audio samples using those sample pads to the right hand side. I have run six groups of four students simultaneously in a room and the bleed from the microphones is insufficient enough to be a problem. It works an absolute treat. Now, what else can I tell you about it? That's I've taken it out to conferences. But as far as the pedagogy goes, and this is where I start as a practitioner coming to this and an evangelist for this, what does it do pedagogically? And I'm not an academic or I'm becoming an academic, but I'm seeing possibilities for me to do some research in this area, which is why it's so wonderful to be amongst you all. Uh, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm starting off on that journey. But this piece of research that I came across when I did a postgraduate um, uh, postgraduate certificate um, in um, academic practice talked about conventionally academic uh, students who are aspirational in terms of um, writing skills and are confident in essay writing, as opposed to the increasing number in Britain, at least, of people who don't come from those kind of backgrounds and who no, previously might have been deemed not as intelligent. So it's a way of increasing inclusivity and access and equality of opportunity to succeed. In, and across the horizontal axis, you, you've got the more active, the, uh, the, the learning activity, the closer uh, non-academic Robert gets to academics, uh, uh, Susan, in, in terms of demonstrating uh, their ability to, to, to um, well, to be graded against the same academic criteria. So I think it adds to these things. In theory, what I'm interested in doing is just pursuing that. And you're ahead of the game, most of you guys, I think, in what you're actually doing to test that out. Um, I'm not a, a theoretical academic, but I think there is this, this vein is a very rich one to follow. I thought you guys, the Humanities Podcast Network, that article, if I'm sure most people have now read it who's, who are on this, I thought your article was absolutely brilliant. It chimed with what I do uh, in so many ways, and it just allowed people to be seen to be successful and feel successful in um, their academic kind of career or career as a student. That's what I tell my colleagues. It's not that difficult to set up and get going. We offer help, um, and that's my contact details, and that's me. Thank you very much. And I'm handing over now. Ah, no. Who am I handing over? Billy, am I handing over to you? I think so. Oh, uh, Billy, off you go. All right. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, Ahmed. Um, so I'm Billy Sauce, Senior Professor of Practice at Tulane University in the Department of Communication and in the Digital Media Practices program where I teach three classes on podcasting. Uh, the first, that's sort of meant to be a sequence. We now have a podcasting track in our digital media practices um, major, which is really exciting. As of like two days ago, our curriculum got approved. So that's worth celebrating. Um, and I want to talk, uh, you know, Ahmed did a great job of kind of outlining for us, uh, you know, the considerations we might have about when to use podcasts in the class and, and how to incorporate them. And then Adam, sort of gave us the evangelists uh, <laughs> celebration of podcasts as a, as a medium for teaching and for learning uh, and discovery generally. Um, I want to talk to you a bit about um, how to resource our podcasts, um, supporting students as we, um, you know, task them with, with creating and producing these things. Um, before I do that, though, I wanted to say, too, that I'm also 
uh, founder and producer uh, with Scott Ferguson, who's in the chat, I see, uh, of the podcast Money on the Left, which is a monthly interdisciplinary podcast that reclaims money's public powers for imaginative, imaginative intersectional politics. And we're presented in partnership with Monthly Review Online, which has been a really great um, development in our kind of history of building out the podcast. And I think something that I would recommend and be happy to talk about as well. Um, um, so to resourcing our students, let's do this. Um, so we've decided that podcasts are a good idea. Uh, and, and this presentation, my, my sort of part in this scaffolded presentation that we were pr providing uh, as, a, as a session um, is to say, okay, you're excited. Now let's, let's slow down and get a little <laughs> bit realistic. Right. Um, let's let's confront um, our, our our constraints and our possibilities, um, honestly. Um, and I'm also in, I've I've as I'm sure other people on this um, session have had before, gotten interested from professors who have no background or experience or, his, or history with podcasting, um, but want to incorporate it in the course. And um, this is a kind of abbreviated version of what I end up offering to them um, in, in terms of things to think about for research, resourcing and supporting. Um, and I've scheduled this or arranged the, the, the presentation in terms of pre-production, production, and post-production. This is on the pedagogy side. So in terms of pre-production, these are the considerations. Um, they're gonna sort of shake out in, in terms of software, hardware, um, and hosting. Um, first, be ready to recommend free audio editing software and or to provide student licenses for subscription-based digital audio workstations. I'm sure uh, many of us are aware of and have used Audacity. That's the free open source um, DAW uh, or digital audio workstation um, that gives you the tools that you need. And the nice thing about this is that it's not it's free and open source, right? So you don't have to, um, you know, there are certain specs that you need to meet, but the specs are low on student computers or computers that you may have um, um, that are accessible to students. It's pretty light software to use and access. Um, in that same vein, uh, but quite a bit more complex and in the kind of realm of uh, sound design and sound engineering is Reaper, which is not f nominally nominally free, but uh, has an indefinite subscription. Um, it, it you can you can trial the software for like almost as long as you for as long as you want, right? It asks you to pay after sixty days, but you can keep using it after that. Um, so I think there's a yeah a two month trial period, and then Adobe Audition, which I use in my classes, and I'm you know uh, I know that the Adobe Creative Cloud is often available on campuses. Uh, sometimes to all students, sometimes to specific students, but in any case, um, you know, if you're going to ad agitate for, advocate for um, in-house provided uh, software for student use, Audition is probably uh, one of the ones that you would consider as part of the broader Adobe Creative Cloud. At Tulane, we just started offering the Creative Cloud to all students. When I first got here, it, I had to ask for permission and licenses for each individual student. Um, but it's powerful and it's a bit more user-friendly um, than I think either Audacity or Reaper. That's been my experience objectively, um, not sponsored by Adobe, have feelings about Adobe and software as a service and generally, but if you're gonna go that route, uh, uh, that's that's one productive and possible way. You also use that in my own production work. Um, hardware, um, I realized that uh, that we have on the uh, the Humanities Podcast Network, the great resource of like teaching with pet, uh, podcasts. Um, and I was looking at that before this panel. I hadn't actually looked at it before, um, uh, but and it recommends basically we you know you don't, you don't really need much more than a phone um, in most cases to record audio. Um, my kind of um, my intervention there is to say we also can't assume. I think we, we ought not to assume that students have a phone, that that phone has space, and that we, we ought to be ready to either provide cheap recommendations or provision the hardware ourselves. Um, and so to that end, I've got some ideas here. We probably, lots of us recognize the Zoom H1N, around a hundred bucks. And then there's the Boya M1 lavalier microphone, which is um, very well, flexible and um, also cheap. It's like under 15 bucks, I think. Um, this can record um, using the XY mics on top, and it's nice and portable and can be sort of taken around. I don't 
have a, it depends on the sort of resources. And I know that money is going to come up in a subsequent panel in terms of where to find it. But I think if you can find money on campus and any of the, the sort of centers on your campus that can support um, pedagogy, um, that the, the Zoom H1N is probably something that you'll consider. And to sort of price it out, this might be a screenshotable page. I'm not going to go through everything here, but this is uh, gives you a sense of what like a single package can can work out to. Um, and you know, through institutions, you might be able to get cheaper prices, tax free, and all that sort of stuff. But looking at for a, a good uh, sort of professional kit that we might be able to lend out to students. And that, in fact, I do lend out to students in my classes. Uh, coming in under 300 bucks. And this one is sp special for its ability to turn this Zoom H1N from just the XY mic into a um, uh, a device that records two tracks on separate channels. So these adapters make it possible to have two microphones recording to the left, one, one recording to the left channel, one recording to the right channel, and you effectively have double, um, you know, what would normally be possible through just using that. You can isolate the track separately. So it can be a nice two-person, one-on-one interview set up there. Hosting. Uh, the question here um, that I think is important to consider too is how public do you want this work to be? Um, I have in my own pedagogy decided it's important to, to keep the pod podcasts in-house and to share them in-house while at the same time trying to uh, duplicate the experience of going through the, the process of publishing a podcast, creating the show notes, publishing into a feed. Um, and to that end, I've used, uh, I use a, a hosting service called Captivate that uh, allows you to use private podcast feeds. That way you can generate individual links that go out to people in the classroom and they can, in their podcast app, uh, receive you know, um, podcasts from your class and they can listen to their peers' podcasts and also see their podcast appear in a podcast feed, which I think is pretty, it's important to me, right? Um, and I think it's a pretty cool experience and part of it. Um, uh, this is an example of what it looks like in a podcast that I've done with students before. Um, and we have here the private podcast notification. So that's just, just for us. Production. <laughs> I got very little here other than be ready to provide tech support and plan to hold and coordinate draft workshops. Treat this a lot like um, I would another class, like in communication where we're writing essays. It's nice to be able to check in on each other's work. Should say we do individual projects and team projects. And in both cases, it's a great idea to have a draft due earlier in the semester, workshop it, offer comments, and then have something more final due later, in my experience. Um, post production and grading, that can be a tricky one too. Um, um, you know, a lot of it's going to depend on how you design the assignment initially, but in terms of the experience of being a, a, a teacher of podcasting, listening to say 20 podcasts at the, you know, at different points in the semester, um, it's nice to have your own feed. This doesn't even require hosting. There are certain apps where you can sideload podcast apps, podcast player apps where you can sideload or upload MP3 files from your computer into the podcast player and you can listen to it like you would any other podcast. Again, getting that sort of feeling of authentic experience of listening to a podcast, you can either even slow down and listen faster um, and so on and so forth. So here we have, um, and I just also use, use this in my own personal production workflow to, to mix things and see how it sounds on AirPods. Um, and I'm really excited to hear uh, what others are doing. This is not offered to be anything other than a kind of indication of my experience of what's worked and the things that I've found important to think about throughout the process, but especially, as you might note, from the pre-production. After I've decided I'm going to do it, what do I need to be able to offer as support for students um, uh, to be able to feel good about incorporating this new artistic medium in most cases for people who are won't have much experience in many cases working with audio specifically and discreetly. And I guess I would say one last resource that I would shout out and say is incredibly important is your librarians. Um, and to that end, I'm happy to pass the baton to Lisa Hooper, who is uh, uh, head of the media services desk at the Tulane University Library. Lisa, hook us up. Hey, everybody. Yes, libraries. I was through everybody's really fabulous talk. I was like, also, check in with your libraries, see what tools and resources they have, but I'll get there. So hello again, I'm Lisa, I'm head of media services 
at uh, Howard Tilton Memorial Library at Tulane University down here in New Orleans. I occasionally get to work with Billy down here at Tulane. So what does media services do and why am I even on this session? Um, my department, and I'm totally reading so I don't go off track, I apologize y'all, but my department really works to foster equitable opportunities for interdisciplinary discovery, innovative scholarship, and skill development through creative play with multimedia collections and media tools. And so how that has translated into practicality is providing equipment that students can check out, students and staff, and sometimes faculty too, um, can check out. It needs to be really um, low entry curve. So we tend to have sort of the lower level, easy to figure out plug and play type equipment. Um, and then I also provide workshops um, like basic introduction to podcasting or basic introduction to audio editing with Audacity. And through those workshops, it's mostly just taking the fear and the unknown out of it, out of the equation. And then what that sort of turned into over the past few years is um, students individually reaching out to me saying, hey, my teacher assigned us this podcast assignment. I don't even know. And like, there's so much I don't even know that they don't even know what questions to ask, right? So I think that's where I come in in my role with, with podcasting here on our campus is sort of filling in the gaps. And so I think what I have to say is mostly for all of the educators out there or students who might not be too deep into the world of podcasting, maybe you're also learning the ins and outs of it, but you really want to do an assignment because podcasting assignment is actually a pretty valuable thing when it's it's built correctly. And I think um, Dr. Ahmed really offered a really great workflow to help think through that in a more effective manner. So now I'm just going to, if I'm talking too fast, y'all just let me know. Um, so what I see from my conversations with students, both individually and then when the faculty, they talk to their faculty member and their faculty invites me into their classroom to do a workshop for them. This is what I see. It's, it's really easy for us um, in this day and age to make assumptions about our students' comfort with technology and even their ability to use that technology and their previous experience with it. I think we tend to have a higher expectations than reality sometimes. Um, and so when I'm invited into a class specifically to talk to them about the resources and tools available for their podcast assignment, my favorite thing to do is sort of start my conversation out by saying, I'm here to be sure you have the tools and resources to succeed in this assignment. But before I dig in, what are your concerns? What are your questions? What is making you worry about the assignment? Like what's keeping you up at night? Um, and sometimes I get crickets, like nobody responds, nobody provides anything, and that's okay. I still have a lesson plan in my back pocket. Um, but then there are other times where I just spend the first five minutes writing everything out and I fill a whiteboard with a lot of really valid concerns and questions about the practicalities of how to produce a podcast. Um, and luckily for me, I think most of those questions and concerns are already in my lesson plan. Every once in a while, they throw out something new, but just being intentional about understanding what are they worried about, that will help you remove those initial barriers to success right off the bat, um, is my recommendation. Um, so let's see. Yeah, it's mostly like they just don't know the technology, even a basic of how can I record this, right? So use your cell phone, use your computer mics, check stuff out from the library if they have it available, right? Um, some people are like, how do I do audio editing? Then my question back to the professor is, well, what is your expectation level? Like, do you want them to produce something really, really fancy? Or can they just talk into their mic and that's all you need? And if you want them to just talk into their mic, why are you doing this as a podcast, right? So sort of balancing, what is the purpose of your assignment? Going back to Ahmed's workflow, what is the purpose? What is the value? Is podcast even the right format for your project goals, right? Um, and then the other part of, of what often comes up when I go in specifically to talk about the, the tools and mechanics of recording and podcasting, a lot of what comes up is um, concerns over the process of research. Like, where do I find these research materials? How do I construct this research assignment? And I would shout out to librarians. We help with that, y'all. So if you have research embedded, also consider incorporating that into your work with your students, either yourself or inviting an external librarian in to give that extra um sort of that external, non-judgmental, no fear about um, my professor thinking less of me if I ask these basic, how do I do this research question, right? Um, anyways, so that's sort of one aspect. And then um, 
I think there's always the dreams versus reality. I know when, especially in that first session, I was hearing a lot of conversation. I'm like, oh my gosh, we could do this and we could do that. And what if we did this? Billy, I'm totally going to be talking to you later, by the way, um, with some of these really huge, ideas, big-ish ideas. So we have these big dreams. And I think sometimes the students are actually really into podcasts and they get excited about podcasts. They sort of have this in, envisioned final product for their research assignment that's going to be really big, really shiny, um, but just the reality of them being students, having limited time, limited resources, limited production skills, you might need to sort of keep that in check. And so that's where I think as professors being really, really clear with your expectations is gonna be really helpful for those students who wanna like maybe overachieve. Um, but then it's also gonna be really helpful for those students who feel really intimidated by the idea of doing a podcast, being really clear of like, this is, what I need from you. This is the production value that I'm expecting and here's how to do it, right? Um, so just helping to manage that for your students, I think is really important as I check the time. Um, and then Billy talked about this already, um, but I'm gonna just reiterate the idea of positioning the resources to support your students um, through Billy's work. And I get the impression a lot of you all might already have your own equipment that you make available to your classes or to people enrolled in specific programs. But if you are working with students who are not part of that program or not part of that student, you need to be aware of other resources available on campus. So again, what equipment is available in your library to, to check out or record with? What spaces are available anywhere on campus? Um, are there existing workshop schedules that students can go to as extra to learn if they want to learn the basics of audio editing? Sort of getting those all in position and in front of your students so that they're prepared when it's time to produce. Um, and I already mentioned the research support because research support um, for some students takes a really big space in their brain and other students it takes a smaller space when, and maybe you need to sort of scale those in proportion to each other. Um, that's my perspective as a librarian who tends to interface with the students um, who have had this assignment foisted upon them. Oh, and all meant in good ways. Um, and I think unless anybody, any of the other panels have additional questions, we can probably start taking questions from you all. There were a couple in chat that I was able to catch. So maybe I'll start with a chat question. And if anybody else just wants to speak their question, you could just use the reactions feature in Zoom to raise your hand and just do it that way if that works for y'all. Okay, uh, let me figure out which coffee cup still has coffee in it. The first question of the chat for the session was, are there any specific conditions to ensure higher quality of engagement by the students? And that was originally intended for Adam, but then they also said anybody can answer that. I'm happy to pick it up to begin with, but if anyone wants to to kick in, I think some of those questions might have been answered in what you've subsequently heard. Um, I'm in a lucky position whereby I work in a department or a program that is about broadcast media and is stuffed to the gills with broadcaster pros and microphones and students who are up to speed with, um, you know, presenting or recording or storytelling or whatever. So the challenge I have is engaging students out with that when I take the Roadcaster Pros, which I'm lucky enough to have at my hand, to a politics class or a midwifery class or whatever it is. So I don't know the answer yet because I'm just assuming everybody's going to be so interested, as interested as, as, as my, my students. But what Lisa says is very true. I mustn't underestimate that some people will have fears about that, doubts about that, and not have the level of expertise. That said, it's very easy to facilitate if our learning and teaching enhancement center, who I'm channeling this through, they're fully on board and they have their tech people as well to support people in the classroom or on a module to set things up and run things and to support people as is our library, although not to the extent you are, Lisa. So if you're free in Manchester anytime soon, it would be very handy. Can I, can I just say one thing about grading podcasts? Because that came up. And yes, it can be a bit of a chore sometimes if the podcasts aren't all brilliant and there's 10 of them and you have to plow through them. 
Can I suggest, oh, is that going to go? Yeah, that, if anyone recognizes it, I swim and I find swimming very boring. And I load up a little waterproof MP3 player with my students' podcasts. And I swim length after length, listening to their podcasts and trying to remember what I'm thinking about it so that I can then write them up. It makes both things far less boring. That's my, that's my answer. I'm not sure if it was a very good one, but that's a top tip. Do any of our other panelists have thoughts about conditions to help um, improve quality of engagement among your students or anybody else from the Zoom space too? I feel like you could probably chime in and chat or raise your hand. Like if, if I just I want to like add something like very briefly about like engagement and uh, that, that's like um, when when I teach this part of podcast, that is like part of a class. So not the entire class is about podcast. But one of the things also is about like the the pre production part, and this is something that, that Billy referred to, and um, and not just like about the software and the hardware, but also about like their preparation for for the topic. So they need to to know exactly what they're going to talk about. They need to know exactly what they are going to discuss. That's, that's very important because the production of podcast is not just for the sake of production, but it is they need to link it to something. And what makes engagement really high is when they link it to something that is going on in life, like something that they witness, something that they see, something they experience. And I remember like uh, that was last semester when students like I have a group of students and they chose to have like a podcast to produce a podcast about like uh, uh, shooting in, in at schools. And they started actually to interview parents, students, and teachers. So they got like the different perspectives. And I can see like not only the group that produced that podcast was like engaged with the topic, it's the entire class because we were like very eager to know about that. But the 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 amount of preparation that they did before they started actually producing and recording the podcast was really massive. Like like arranging for interviews and then like meeting with the interviewees and preparing questions and make sure like the questions will not trigger any kind of, you know, like negative experience, making sure. So all these things actually contribute to the engagement. So when you look at the podcast as an experience, it is like the pre-production plays a very important part and it, it contributes to the, to the idea of engagement. Can I just jump in? I find also saying you can write a 2000 word essay or do a podcast increases engagement in my experience but it i think it's naturally attractive to students but then maybe it's just because i work with the students i work with who are immersed in that anyway part of the reason i like podcasting is how collaborative it it can be and so i think a way to get student to that a way that i've found useful for student increasing student engagement is dividing up the labor um, and and creating a team-based assign um, in addition to or maybe instead of a uh, single person assignment so that people can who may be uh, nervous about speaking on tape can instead work on transcription, um, can instead work on editing. Um, and so, so forming teams and um, allowing people to kind of who may be interested generally in podcasts but might have some of the anxiety we talked about um, giving them other opportunities to to be part of a production team. Yeah, Milan, I was going to say, I saw your hand was raised earlier. Go ahead. Yeah, Um. so I, I wanted to actually pick up on something you said, Lisa, about the importance of being clear with students about expectations and about evaluation. Um, and one thing that I've been doing with sort of multimedia projects, including podcasting, is having a grading rubric that, um, among other things, has a list of things that I will not be evaluating that includes things like, you know, accent and pronunciation, because I think, you know, initially I was hesitant to put those things, but it's something that students worry about. And so being really explicit about none of these things are being evaluated, you don't need to worry about these, any and all 
approaches are valid. Um, anyway, that that's one thing that I've been trying to do to sort of um, be clear about what is and isn't being evaluated. But I wanted to ask everyone here, like, what are the best ways that you've found to set expectations to be clear about how you'll be evaluating these projects? I don't think I've done it as well as you do it by the sounds of it. I think that's a fabulous idea because I did get some feedback the first time I ran it outside of a podcasting class and they said, well, we didn't know what tone to set, who was a, who was supposed to be our audience, um, were you wanting us to be relaxed or was it supposed to be like academic, like an essay? And were you marking us for that? So that highlighted that I hadn't thought that through. So I'm going to steal that idea for a start. That I think that's a very, very good idea. This is not. This is what you do not have to worry about. And that changes depending on circumstances. My podcasting students, I want them to sound like professional podcasters. A politics class, it doesn't matter to me. I mean, I want it to be coherent, but I want it to be coherent on the criteria that you would mark an essay on, like the marshalling of ideas and the balancing of viewpoints and the progression of an argument. And I think all of those can be assessed or have criteria that, that you can mark against. But I take it, I assume they just know what I want and that's wrong. Um, I think on the, um, yeah, I, I agree 100% it's important. I think over through trial and error, I've gotten more specific with my rubric and, and I think there's always, there's always room for more specificity and, um, where I've kind of landed, um, in terms of like content versus production side of things is to, is sort of breaking those out in terms of, and, and, and identifying portions of the final grade that, that the production side is worth, and then being clear about what tools uh or what outcomes i'm looking for at the audio level and so we you know look at waveforms and if we're targeting negative 3 db we talk about the tools to use right to to get there and stay there right um and then i articulate apply these tools as necessary and if i can go in and i think i listen to the podcast but i also look at them right when i'm grading in whatever DAW I'm using, um, because that can be a really, really quick way to get to the to the bottom of a problem, um, and it can also help to to diagnose what's going on if you're if you're concerned about the production side of thing, which I think many of us are. Um, being clear about the tools that you're expecting to use, and then uh, dividing up, articulating how much of it is content argumentation based, how much of it is production aesthetic based. I think it's a fascinating subject. And I think what the bottom, of, I'd like to try and get to the bottom of the issue. Does doing a podcast in, say, to take the politics module again, as an example, are you able to then assess students to the criteria you want to for your politics module in the way that they put together a podcast? And if we assume that they can, how can we tell if they engage more and attain higher standards and are engaged, you know, does, is there a way, maybe people are already down this track, is there a way of measuring the improvement in engagement and attainment? My gut feeling is there is, and it's reasonably significant, but it would be lovely to kind of design some research to, to work that out. Maybe people are doing that. I don't know. Mm. Oh, sorry. I stressed I wasn't muted. So you're hearing all of my affirmations there. I apologize. This is really great. And in case y'all haven't seen it, there were a couple of requests in the chat for folks to share their grading rubrics. So if you have a way to drop a link into the chat, I'm sure that would be appreciated. Or if you don't have a link and you don't mind giving your email to a room full of friendly strangers, then maybe you could drop your email in the chat too. 
Um, there's been a lot going on in chat and I'm totally because I, I said I would help moderate um, the q and I'm like, love to Kim Fox, who wrote in the chat, speaking of librarians, I'd like to suggest that educators encourage students to share their work with the library's digital repository, especially if they're doing interviews and oral histories. That is a really, really super fab idea. In fact, I would, I would encourage anybody um, doing any type of podcast on campus, if y'all don't already have a central place, to store or at least provide access out to all of the podcasting happening on campus. Um, maybe start with your library. We're really good at connecting folks, I think. At least we try to be, um, we try. Um, I'm also gonna just take this other library question because, sorry, I'm totally using my platform right now. This one is from Dr. Beth Sockman. Um, she was wondering about the support that we offer. And the question I think was, how was that negotiated between faculty and staff? Um, that's a really great question. So here at Tulane, the university IT does a really stellar job supporting faculty. They have so many resources to support faculty. Um, so what I decided to do was to make my resources available specifically well, not specifically, but target students and target staff. And I realized my internet connection is unstable, so I apologize if I'm breaking up, y'all. Um, so the resources I have are really targeted at students and staff. Faculty, if they want it, is bonus. Um, and that faculty are incorporating and having their students reach out to the library to help them complete their class assignments. That is fabulous. It's just one of those things where I realized we have folks like Billy and a lot of his colleagues who are teaching these really high level production value classes that are really great. Um, and they're, they're sort of available for students who are in a certain track of study, or if you spend the extra money to take this class. Um, and then there are other students who are like, oh, maybe I could use this in my personal life. Maybe I could use this skill in my postgraduate career, but it's not built in to my, my programming yet. And so that's that was my initial target audience for those students and those staff who wanted to just develop that skill on their own interest. And it's sort of grown into a more, it's not really holistic, but it's just grown in its own weird way. That was a long thing. There were many, many more questions in the chat. Let me see, it's 1248. So I'm just gonna jump in. Um, I'm gonna come back to the second question and go to the third question, which was, how do you help your students not sound like they're reading their research material, but rather sound more natural while referencing scripts? I'm jumping to that one because I hear that a lot as well. I'll leave that to our brilliant panelists and experts. I don't let them read out. I mean, I do, they can prepare they have to prepare that's all part of it the marshalling of things so they have things at their fingertips i encourage them to be spontaneous and they can submit if i require it a reference list on paper so supporting material could be supplied if it's that kind of assessment we did it as a group when i was doing my postgraduate my group of colleagues our little mini group we did our self-reflection as a podcast between us and that needed to be underpinned with academic kind of citations. So we just talked about them. We didn't quote directly. We could have done, I suppose. I think we might have thrown a verbatim line or two in. But what we did was then we supported it with a, a reference list. There's nothing worse, in my opinion, um, having people read off. If I'm interviewing someone for a program I'm making and they come with written answers, I say, oh, that's very interesting. And I pick it up and I put it beside me and I then ask them and maybe not ethical, but it 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 engenders discussion. I think that's that that can kill a podcast really if they're reading. Um it's like also like there is another like there are two things that I um I use with the students. So the first the first thing is just to ask them to uh, like rehearse, like the, the the whatever they have written, 
and just make sure that they make it like, you know, like more conversational thing, not reading from it. And I show them like examples from from the Internet, like from other podcasters. And uh, they just like, you know, like they keep like, you know, like putting things like notes and all these things and and signs just to show like when they pose and all these things. So so students can see something like that. So that is the way uh, now I call it like the traditional way of doing it. Uh, there is another way like to use the AI to do that. So what you can do is just like they can uh, like put their transcript or like whatever like they have written on like any platform like chat GPT and then they ask chat GPT to convert it into like a conversational script. So that will give them, you know, like uh, more more assistance. So like there are different ways of doing that. But like the most important thing for students is to practice and rehearse whatever they have before they start recording that that that, that also helps i think I would add, oh, yeah, sorry go, go ahead billy go ahead no no to that i would add uh yeah i would second the rehearsal and preparation um i used to teach public speaking and that there's just no replacement for a good rehearsal and knowing your script um uh, to, to supplement that though uh, I find that the the sort of process approach to podcast production where they're drafting and then listening to and having other people listen really, you know, a lot of people don't like to listen to themselves. Um, and if they're comfortable enough to do that uh, and in a podcasting class where they want to learn how to do production and, and narration, um, usually the the narration or vocals after that rough draft are much improved. Yeah, I wanted to particularly point out a comment in the chat that actually speaks really closely to what Billy just said. This comment was from, um, and I apologize if I mispronounce your name, Angel Vasquez, and I'm just going to read it directly. I found out during the podcast workshop that listening and timestamping help develop a clear sense of what your ideas are. In fact, if you follow instructions, you discover how several ideas are running through our brains, allowing the creator to be transparent on how they're targeting, what they would like to say how important it is and what they have to say and eventually that leads to the research and I, they also note that the research is the proper preparation to prevent poor performance during podcasts i think that's the other aspect that sometimes teachers who just assignment in place of who assign podcast instead of a research paper they sort of forget that performance aspect so i really like that emphasis um yeah, several people have also mentioned voice acting techniques, and somewhere in the chat, I dropped a link to a page I've created um, that includes a link to a YouTube video from The Insider, how actors train their voices, and it has clips of The Rock and other really famous people looking really, really ridiculous. Okay, and I'm so sorry, John, I just see you raised your hand, so I'm going to mute myself and let you talk now. Okay, Barber. sorry, uh, no problem. The, it's an engaged conversation and a lot of voices presenting some interesting ideas. I don't know that mine will be interesting, but I think that there's actually a more fundamental approach to answering the question, how do we get uh, students or voice actors, for that matter, to sound as if they're being conversational? And that's uh, to remind them that their podcast begins with a well-written script. And the script should be written for the ear rather than the eye. And most of your students may be writing for the eye because I'm about E-Y-E -E, um, or perhaps the eye of the ego of the author uh, because that's the lingua franca of the university. And so there needs to be some code shifting that's perhaps taught or at least facilitated and that is to um, encourage people to write as if they were speaking because they will be speaking and they will sound different when they're speaking as opposed to when they're trying to uh, write the language of the university. So I, a script that's written for the ear, I just, I'm repeating myself here, but I just want to throw in as a good way to start solving this problem of getting people to sound, uh, not sound so stilted as if they're reading uh, something that really doesn't represent the way they speak. Thank you very much.
Um, there are, there's one more question that I was able to capture from chat. I hope I'm not missing any, but this one takes us back to, well, actually, wait, I'm going to do two things. One, in the chat earlier in the conversation, several people were dropping in recommendations for transcript services, online transcript services. So the ones that actually that I've used, um, because it was the first one that people mentioned to me and I'm too lazy to go look for others. The one that I've used is Otter AI. Other people, oh my gosh, my handwriting y'all, mentioned Descript, not free. It's another program called Eddy. I guess it's produced by Headliner. Rev.com, also not free. And I think my handwriting says my good tape. I'm going to try to drop those into the chat. That last one I have a big old question mark on because my handwriting is questionable. But that practical aspect of transcripting takes us. Oh, it is my good tape. Thank you um, for dropping that into the chat. Good, good, good. Um, the other practical question that's very, I think, closely related to that is any recommendations for online editing platforms or audio editing platforms that allow for more collaborative projects? I'd say that audition, audition, it's not super intuitive, but you can share the session folder. And so we use Box, um, which Tulane provides any, you know, any kind of Dropbox system where they can upload the session file plus the associated files. They can share it that way and work collaboratively. That's um, what we're after. I think BandLab, if anyone's used BandLab, it's a music production thing, but I think it 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 has enough that podcast content use, uh, makers could could use. And can I just pick up on one thing that John talked about, which just touched upon right at the very end, this idea of authenticity in terms of how you come across and not being stilted and not sounding red. I think that's important as well to try and encourage people to be authentic about what they are trying to say. And if they feel it and mean it and it means something to them, then I think there's far more chance that they will be um, passionate and yet um, academically sound enough not to have to worry too much about sticking to a script. I might be wrong, but I think authenticity is important. I just, I'd like to shout out, um, so Elisa and the Tulane Libraries are really supportive here, but uh, I've had some really good experience reaching out to our local library system in New Orleans, working with them for one of our production classes on producing some content for their music streaming website. That's, it's a service learning class. It's currently underway right now. Um, and then also, if you're lucky enough to have a local radio station um, that would be open to working with you. Uh, we have WTUL here at, at uh, Tulane. Um, in the spirit of the stay local, there are more resources. Uh, and yeah, they frequently and often invite, involve librarians. My computer is telling me we have two minutes left. We can either fill that maybe with one more question and I didn't see any more in the chat. I hope I got them all. So if you have a question, raise your hand. Or, well, now my computer says we have one minute, or we can ask each um, panelist for one final brief pearl of wisdom, <laughs> just to put you all on the spot. <laughs> uh, yeah, like, like, uh, one, one last thing is, like, if, you, if you're going to use podcast for, like, in the class, just make sure, like, we ask all students, like, to get prepared uh, before they produce, or, uh, like, like or use podcast also like as an educator as a teacher instructor faculty member make sure also that you will prepare for the podcast experience in your in your class and preparation like starts with deciding on the software hardware that you're going to use to what extent it is linked to your learning objectives to your assessment your instruction so make sure that you are well prepared for that and guess what like sometimes podcast is not the right option to use in the class this also could be a possibility so uh yeah this is actually what i want to say in the end practice set up practice for success sessions 
I, what I do is I have them do a practice one one week. I give them feedback straight away, which I play out snippets of good practice. I don't go for the bad stuff. I, I illustrate from each group the best bit and they hear it in class. They talk about it. We have a little discussion about the next one. They do the next one in class. And so it goes on. And then we ended up, we end up with a graded one six weeks in and everybody is well scaffolded. So practice, practice, practice. There's a ton of great uh, emerging and established research and podcast studies. And then also uh, somebody shouted out the textbook that I've used and I can't, I can't remember the name, but um, um, I'd love some links. Good I'd love it for that. Yeah. But I, I think a lot of it for me, like one of the things exciting and um, that I would encourage folks to, I found really exciting to do is dive into what makes podcasting different from writing an essay. Because they could, they're radically different, and there's lots of new um, avenues for learning, right, for yourself and for students by exploring sound and voice. Great, and I think with that we will conclude our session on pedagogy. Lisa, did you have one pearl of wisdom you wanted to share? Talk to your library. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Thank you all so much for joining us. This was our second out of four sessions happening today.